extreme skepticism. How would you portray that? And what is the theory laziness of observation? And why shouldn't they be confused with each other? Right. Uh, well, there is a there is a relationship between the two. Extreme skepticism um, was given birth in one of the ancient uh, philosophical schools in ancient Greece. Um, and extreme skepticism is the view that we can absolutely, absolutely know nothing. We know nothing to be true or false. That's the extreme form of skepticism. And I think that the way, so the way the, the skeptic philosophical school in ancient Greece, one of their key arguments was that take any position that the, um, the earth is flat or the earth is a globe, take any position and both sides can argue just as cogently for their view as any other. There seems to be no end to the argument. The argument will continue on forever with argument, counter-argument, uh, uh, and then argument, counter-argument. So that was one of the key arguments. In its modern form, because the theory ladenness of observation was re only really fully realised from about 1950s on, Norwood Russell Hansen in a seminal paper. And um, so that, that insight is that take any observation, like for example, um, a common example I use is I'm looking at a tree at the moment, so I say, I'm observing a tree. Now, you might think, well, that's a concrete fact. It's given immediately in observation. There's no inference there at all, so it seems, and to common sense, so it seems. But when you think about it, my stating there's a tree in front of me and that I'm observing a tree, there's a whole bunch of theories that are sitting in the background that are giving credence to that observation statement. So what are those theories that are assumed? Um, it's the um, electromagnetic theory of light to begin with. So my observation is assuming that there are photons being emitted from the sun. They're being uh, reflected off the trunk and leaves of the tree. Uh, they enter my eyeball and here we bring in the theory of reflection and refraction um, that forms uh, an image at the, uh, at, at the base of my eye which it then uh, gets converted into electrical signals so now we're bringing in again more of electromagnetic theory um, so that information is then passing along neural uh, neural pathways. We're now bringing in neuroscientific theories uh, and um, uh, that signal, information signal, ends up in the uh, visual cortex which is then somehow uh, the brain converts that to the uh, subjective image of, of a tree with its brownness and its greenness. So you can see there's a whole bunch of theories that are assumed by my very simple observation statement that um, I'm observing a tree. Um, and it's, it's called theory ladenness because that observation is, um, is laden by uh, a whole string of theories and I've just outlined some of them. So how does that help the um, skeptic? A uh, skeptic uh, like um, Paul K. Feyerabend, uh, he'd say, uh, well, how do you know those theories that you are presuming when you're looking at the tree to justify the observation statement, I'm looking at a tree, how do you justify those theories? And I would say, well, you justify those theories by um, constructing, uh, by doing experiments and making observations to see whether your predictions come true. And Farabin would say, ah, then you're using observations to justify other observations, but those observations, they're just as theory laden as the original observation. So you're in a circuitous, you're in a loop, never ending loop. So how can you know anything? So that's how the theory ladenness of observation can give some credence to a skeptical viewpoint. How does science make progress in light of the theory ladenness of observation? 
Yeah, so we can't get away from theories. Um, theories are inextricably linked with um, not only our ordinary everyday observations, but our, uh, the observations we make in our experiments as well. So I think the trick is in finding out which are the true theories, you've got to get independent evidence for that theory to be able to say, okay, that's now a justified theory. We are now justified in saying that's true. So what kind of evidence can we look for? Well, I look for evidence that's independent of the theory. And one way that it can be independent of the theory is that the evidence is independent of the construction of the theory. Because if you make up a theory just to explain a particular piece of evidence, well, you already know what you're trying to explain. It could just be an ad hoc, an ad hoc construct. Well, it is an ad hoc construction. And here's the other main problem with just relying on theories, um, rely, relying on theories that you don't have any independent evidence. Um, there's what's called the Duham Quine, Duham Quine underdetermination thesis. So for any theory that you can think up, construct to explain a particular observation, there are literally an infinite number of theories, an infinite number of different theories that you, from that you can deduce, along with some background assumptions, you can deduce the same observation. So, okay, so we've got an infinite number of, uh, potentially an infinite number of theories that we can uh, explain a particular observation, how are we going to decide between them? Okay, so I think this is where we need this independence criterion. Uh, and I think an important independence criterion is that the evidence, the evidence is independent of the construction of the theory. So in modern parlance, we're looking for um, a, a, a prediction that's novel. We're looking for the theory that we construct to predict something that we would not have otherwise known about without the theory. And let me give you a, a really good example. Um, with Newtonian mechanics, uh, it was uh, extremely successful for a long time. Um, it successfully predicted uh, the apogee of the moon, um, the closest point that the moon gets to the, uh, gets to the, the earth. And it was highly successful and, uh, and predictive in quite a number of areas. It ran into a problem though, because the orbit of Uranus uh, was not going as predicted uh, by Newtonian mechanics. So, um, so New the Newtonians said, oh, there must be another planet that's outside, further away to us from Uranus. Uh, and that is influencing the orbit of uh, Uranus uh, in a way that's different than what ordinarily would have been predicted by Newtonian mechanics. So that set in place a big search for this unknown, unknown planet. It was a planet that we didn't know existed yet. Uh, now, it took a long time, I think it was Le Verrier in some time in the 1700s from memory, um, who eventually found uh, in his telescope uh, um, the planet Neptune. Now, they were looking in a particular part of the sky, a narrow range of the sky for this planet, uh, that if Newtonian mechanics was true, that's where you would find this Planet. And lo and behold, uh, over many, after many years of finding, they eventually found it. Now that was a stunning prediction of Newtonian mechanics. It was finding a planet that we would not have otherwise known was there. So that's what I count as a, an independent verification, an independent objective verification of Newtonian mechanics at that time. So that's the kind of evidence we're looking for. Um, a successful novel prediction from a theory. Mm -hmm.